Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Now, I know this is going to sound a little bit weird coming from a rabbi, but I really dislike the word holy. And yes, this is partly the beginning of yet another Paul Strasko rant where I say that the translation of words that we use in Hebrew are usually inadequate for the subtlety of the Hebrew word. In this case, the Hebrew word is kodesh, which doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as holy. Now, before we get too much into it, it's really worth taking a moment to think about this. If you're, it's not Shabbos yet, grab a piece of paper and pencil and pause the YouTube video and write down a little bit on what you think holy means, who is or is not holy and why, what is or is not holy and why, because there's an awful lot of words that we use all the time and we just, because the words are common, because they're used in everyday religious parlance, we just assume that we know what they are, or that we have a good grasp of the actual definition, or at least how we think the definition manifests in our lives. And oftentimes we, we just don't. And so take a moment, try it. What does holy mean? Who's holy? Who's not? What's holy? What's not? Pause. And now we're back. So first of all, holy, we don't even get that as a nice translation from the Latin, sanctus. Uh, holy comes from the German heilig. And in German, heilig, yes, it's usually translated directly as what does heilig mean? It means holy. What does holy mean? It comes from sanctus. Heilig means some variation or some combination of virtuous or even ordained or sanctified, which again comes from Sanctus, but ordained almost in the sense of preordained. And, and again, this is kind of the vision of the magic wand tapping someone or something on the head and saying, okay, now you're holy. You are distinct from something else. You are somehow more something and things that aren't holy are less something. And that's not too far from the Hebrew, at least on the surface level, the Hebrew word kodesh means separated. And within the various root groups in Hebrew, there are two different groups that deal with division in this way. There's lehavdil, so if you do havdala at the end of Shabbat, lehavdil ben kodesh lechol, who separates between that which is holy and that which is profane or every day. And then the word holy itself, which has more of the connotations of being elevated. And the reason that this is even hitting me today is because we're at the end in the third triennial cycle of Parsha Truma. And Truma is kind of the uh, analog of the Parsha dealing with synagogue membership dues. So yay, everyone loves this particular Parsha. But in this case, we have the laws for the building of the the Hechal and the Devir, called the Kodesh and the Kodesh Kodeshim, the inner chambers of the temple. The, so the antechamber as you walk in is the Kodesh, it's the Holy. And then as you walk into the Holy of Holies, the Kodesh Kodeshim, that's where the Ark goes, and it's the specific commands for putting up the curtain that separates the Prochet between the two of them, and then what goes in and how you put the Ark together. And this becomes the prototype for the first temple, Solomon's Temple, and then the second temple after the Babylonian exile. And the terms later on are used, then the Hechal for the outer chamber, the Kodesh, and the Devir for the inner chamber. That's technical stuff that's not so important for the point. But one of the first senses we get is that, well, if we've got a Kodesh and a Kodesh Kodeshim, then one of the connotations we need to deal with in holiness is that there are things that are even more holy. There's something that is holy or separate or elevated, and then there is more holy, more separate, more elevated. And what do we mean by that? So I'm going to use two examples or two thoughts or two meditations from other parts of the Tanakh to kind of bring this all together. And the first one is something I talk about a lot in congregations, and that is the story of Korach. Korach, another priestly family, right? The Levites were the tribe that contained various priestly families and some were in competition with each other. And we had the people who were, according to our narrative, supposed to be the priests, the sons of Aaron. But we have competing groups. We find out in Samuel, for example, that there's a city called Nob that had a whole bunch of priests and they traced their lineage back to Moshe. So more interesting than our narrow understanding of, of the narrative often leads us to believe. But Korach was a competing group. And the story of Korach within the Torah has Korach standing up and saying, hey, Moses, you take too much on yourself. Don't you know that we're all holy? And that statement, which seems so innocent, if not self-evident, well, you know, of course we're all holy. We're all engaged in this dialogue with that which is greater than us, so that's what makes us holy. And next thing we know, the, the earth opens up and swallows all the people who would agree with such a thing. And the teaching that I always try to give on this one 
and asking the question, what's so profoundly wrong about that statement, is that it's a missed opportunity and a misdirection for the subtleties of Kodesh within Judaism. And that's that we aren't Kodesh. We're not holy. Holy is not a state of being. It is what we can become through action, the two verbs associated, lihit kadesh and le kadesh, to make oneself holy or to change or alter something, the nature of something in some truly metaphysical way to where its status is that of elevated in the perspective of the eternal. So when Korach says, hey, we're all that, the missed opportunity is to say, no, what we really need to do is have the equal ability to strive for holiness as you, Moses. But by saying we're all that, then what's taken away is the understanding that we don't just get the magic wand that says, hey, you're holy. We work for that. Whatever that means, that's something that requires profound effort. Now, the other reason that I disagree that holiness is something that can just be conferred or just given, so the Kodesh Kodeshim, the Holy of Holies, so we think, well, if there's anything that just had the status of being holy, it must be the Holy of Holies. And then we get one of the most heartbreaking, weird, mystical dramas in the entire Tanakh, and it starts around chapter 10 of Ezekiel. So this is part of the crazy vision of the Merkava, the mystical vision of the chariot, which is in many ways the prototype of Kabbalah, the beginning of, of Jewish mysticism. But this is a vision that Ezekiel is having. Ezekiel is in the Babylonian exile. He's not in Jerusalem, but he's gone into a trance state and he's having a prophecy of what's happening at the spiritual level in Jerusalem in its last years before the Babylonians finally destroyed the first temple. And in this vision, he's indeed seeing the chariot, the Merkava, and on top of the chariot is the Shekhinah, the presence of God, which we in our narrative imagine as being present in the Holy of Holies. Now, just pay attention to this for a second. We've got the Holy of Holies, and present in it is the Shekhinah. Okay, so there's a binding there. But as, again, in our narrative, the kings become worse, and they stop worshiping the Eternal, and they erect other altars, and they worship other gods, and they practice forbidden magic. As this happens, we slowly see the Shekhinah, carried by the Merkava, leaving the temple, pausing by the gates to the Temple Mount, then going all the way to the East Hill overlooking Jerusalem. In other words, what it looks like to have the presence of God leaving that which is the most holy, which I would then say removes it from being practically, we can still call it the Holy of Holies, but as it's lost the presence of God, it no longer is the Holy of Holies. And in Ezekiel, this seems to even be a shock for the prophet as he wakes up and he says, oh my goodness, I need to go and explain what I just saw to the people who are in exile because the entire concept of being in exile is the very concept of being no longer centered in that which elevates us. In the case of this narrative, the temple ritual. So what am I trying to get at? This is a little bit esoteric. Well, if we just use the word holy, that's holy. And, and think back, I hope you did the exercise with me because I think more and more around us, we have this idea that by default belonging, so certain individuals or certain groups, simply by who they are, are holy. And that is the sin of Korach. So just to use an absolute absurd, absurd example, let's say I am a member of the group that is the world acknowledged most sanctified holy group order of the people who always do the right thing. And everyone in the world acknowledges that that is the name of the group and it's a deserved name of the group. And I go and God forbid murder someone. Now I'm still a member of that group. However, what is more important, my membership in that group in that moment or the horrible thing that I've just done? And if the answer is anything other than the horrible thing I've just done, then we have been captured by the sin of Korach. We are believing that someone by nature of who they are or by nature to whom they belong are holy. And that is exactly why Korach was not treated so well by our narrative. See, Judaism is trying to tell us we all as individuals have the responsibility for the holiness for which we are responsible. The holiness that we are responsible for is our life as an individual, how we behave and act, how we elevate ourselves. It is then also our relationships, how we behave in our relationships, how we behave within them, how we elevate them, how we repair them when they are broken. That is the act of holiness. Again, go back to the temple. Why was there a Kodesh and a Kodesh Kodeshim there? Because it required constant effort. 
Now, the effort became probably just the default, we would clean the right things at the right time and forget the intentionality that's required. So we can go through the motions, but if our intentionality isn't to be a holy people, and if our intentionality is not to be within holy relationships, elevated, then the presence of God leaves that thing in the metaphorical, and I would argue in a very, very real sense. And if you want to look at it in a slightly different way, if Kodesh is separate and elevated together, then what's lechol, which is, again, bad translation into profane, but the everyday or the opposite of Kodesh, that's just the normal. So if we go through and we take across the entire world what normal good behavior would be, which most of us strive for in some way or another, I would hope, or at least most of us probably assume that we're engaging in good behavior, that's not Kodesh because that is by default every day. So we don't get to have any label of being Kodesh, of making ourselves Kodesh, of being a part of the process of holiness, unless we do the work to rise above that, which means not just experiencing every day within our relationship, but actively elevating that. Not just going through the motions in life, but actively elevating that. What do you think Shabbat is? We have to live every day and survive and earn paychecks and all that other practical stuff, but yet we need a time to step back so that we have the opportunity to do something different, different, separate, something that can allow us to elevate our lives. That's the central meaning of Shabbat, as well as the holidays. And then we go out to the collective level. Is our group just getting through the motions and surviving because it has a certain status? Or are we actively conscious of what we're doing, how we are lifting up and tearing down? And if we're constantly in that consciousness as a group of looking at ourselves and saying, how can we do better? Then we are a holy group. But if we are not, if we are going through the motions by virtue of who we thought we were in the past, by virtue of the founders of the group, by virtue of however it is we want to see that, we are not holy. We're lechol. We're every day. We're just going through the motions. But that's not what holiness is. All right, I could end it there, but I think that there's something that we can just add on as a little cherry on top to this discussion. See, here's the tricky thing. When you get into the Holy of Holies as a metaphor for us, we all have the most protected and most sacred place inside of us. But the question to tie this all together is, what's in your Holy of Holies? In other words, the place that it takes the most to get into, the place that no one can look into, for most of us, unfortunately, what's hidden in there are the things that we are most ashamed of. That's what it means to have the presence of God leave a holy of holies. Instead of being the place, our innermost being that we want to shine to everyone else, the part of us that oftentimes is most walled away is the part that contains stuff that we are most desperate to keep other people from seeing and understanding. And that's what life feels like without the presence of the eternal, however it is that we understand the eternal. This process of coming back to a place where we can shout to the highest mountains what's in our Kodesh Kodeshim is the process of inviting holiness back into our lives. The tools are the simplest in the world. When Shabbos begins, take that moment to step away from the arguing and the strife and the schadenfreude and looking for the people to tear down and start letting the eternal back into our personal holy of holies, the holy of holies within our relationships, and ultimately the holy of holies within the entire world. How interesting it would be to see Ezekiel's reverse vision, what this world looks like as the presence of God once again descends into us and into the places that we've kept most secret that now become elevated. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Ooh.